and the degree of dis, uh, discordance decides the embryonic loss. So the early pregnancy, if you have a discordance, what do we tell this mother? Do we tell her? We must tell her that there is, you do not tell the patient that the baby is going to die or something bad is going to happen because the predictivity is poor. So you just keep a watch, you ask her to come for serial growth scans. Now, the next scan that we would do for a twins would be a 11 to 13 week 6 day scan where we could relook at the chorionicity and this becomes the timeline or if it's the first time you're seeing this woman, it becomes a timeline for subsequent screening intervals and thus you decide the date of delivery. Again, you check at the chorionicity, sees there's a twin peak sign, if there's a T sign like Dr. Sri Devi has mentioned or there is no amnion and decide the chorionicity. Can we date and if we do date and if there is a discordancy, how do we date this pregnancy? We date these pregnancies by the larger fetus. We always presume that the small fetus is abnormal or it's a pathologically small and you always date the pregnancy using the larger CRL because unless you date then you're going to unnecessarily either time the delivery earlier or late. So how do you calculate discordancy when you're doing the CRL measurement? You take the largest CRL, subtract it with the smaller CRL, by larger CRL expressed as a percentage, this tells you the discordance percentage. And if you have this early distribution, early discordance in the first trimester, it could be that the inner cell mass in monochorionic has split into unequal halves. So now this is an example of dichorionic twins with discordant CRL. We call them discordant if the CRL difference is more than 10% and these are the fetuses who may subsequently show you some structural or chromosomal abnormality. So you need to follow these fetuses very, very closely. But if it's monochorionic, so there's a difference. Like we said, you must know what is chorionicity. So if you are scanning a dichorionic uh, fetus and you find there's a difference in the two CRLs, follow these fetuses for chromosomal and structural. But if you're seeing this discordance in a f monochorionic pregnancy, and then you have to watch out for twin to twin transfusion, especially if the CRL difference is more than 10 to 12 millimeters. So how do we follow these pregnancies? Second trimester, these pregnancies, irrespective of whether dichorionic or monochorionic, they definitely need a TIFA scan. But a monochorionic uh, pregnancy will need a rescan at 16th week. And this 16th week scan is going to stratify her into a low risk monochorionic or a high risk. And how do we do that? We not only measure the CRL, we look at the bladder size, we look at the Lyca volume. Is it clear? So when you have a discordance at 16th week, you look at the difference in CRL, you look at the amount of Lyca, you look at the bladder size and the low risk fetus is where there is similar concordant fluid, that the fluid pockets in both are similar the concordant cord insertions, concordant AC, and if the liquor amount is okay, bladder size is okay, ACs are not very different, then this is a low risk monochorionic fetus. Whereas, if you see that the discrepancy is more than 12 millimeters, or NT difference is more than 20% 20, uh, 20 and this discordant amniotic fluid, these are the fetuses who, can like, who are likely to go for TTTS, weight discordance or IUD. So this is very, very important that a 16-week scan in a monochorionic uh, pregnancy should look not only for the size, also for the bladder size and the liquor amount. How many of you really scan here? I see only one hand, two hands. Yeah, but at least if you get a report of dichorionic, monochorionic, you need to ask for a rescan. If it's a monochorionic uh, pregnancy, then at least ask for a rescan at 16 weeks and then at 20 weeks. But if it's a dichorionic pregnancy, ask for a scan at 20 weeks for cervical length and TIFA. So second trimester scan is going to classify your monochorionic twins into high risk and low risk. 
So then we call these women at third trimester and this is where we identify discordant growth. So the steps would be first accurate dating by history, sac size, dating the pregnancy using the CRL which is bigger or the head circumference, then establishing chorionicity and third would be labeling or naming twins. How will I know which baby is what I'm measuring? So you need to label or name the twins. Apart from dating the pregnancy, apart from establishing chorionicity, the step three would be labeling the twins so that you're consistently and reliably measuring the same twin every time she comes. And how do we do this? We look at the intertwin membrane. If this is a sac, this is the intertwin membrane. If I just look at the fetus which is closer to the cervix, the next time this fetus may come down and I will incorrectly label this one, uh, one and two and then later two and one. So not only this, in a horizontal and in a vertical plane, look at the intertwin membrane and the one which is inserted here. This becomes then twin one and this becomes twin two. And again, turn the probe, look at the insertion transversely and the one which is lower is one the one which is above. So you are actually going anti-clockwise. Is this clear? So if you do this consistently every time she comes, you will measure this same fetus as fetus 1 and this would be fetus 2. Because if you just see what is closer to the cervix, you have seen that this baby is now become this. So if you do not label the twins or name the twins as 1, 2, then you're not going to really be able to diagnose discordant twins. So the labeling should be standardized, labeling should be reliable, and you should do it according to laterality or vertical orientation so that you're consistently measuring the same fetus every time you're going to see it. So the fetal growth now we know depends on genetic factors, on placental function, and discordant growth we knew could be based on maternal, fetal, or placental factors. So step four is now assessing the growth. So dating, chorionicity, third is labeling the twins, fourth is assessing the growth on growth curves. So which curves do you use for growth curves for establishing the growth in twins? We use the same growth curves as we do for a singleton, but we know that after 30 weeks, there is a little flattening of the curve in multiple pregnancy. So what is discordancy in the second or third trimester? It is nothing but again the same difference like we mentioned it in CRL difference. Now it is the larger baby's weight minus the smaller baby's weight expressed as a percentage of the larger baby's weight. This is what is discordancy. The other ways of diagnosis of discordance twins are looking at the BPD difference, looking at the abdominal circumference or femur length or estimated fetal weight. And depending on the percentage of difference, you call it either mild or severe. If it's less than 20%, you call it mild discordancy. And this is the physiological genetic variation in each twins. But if it's more than 25%, you need to see if that smaller baby is also growth restricted because they have an unfavorable prognosis. So if you look at the incidence of discordant growth, it's about 20% have only mild 5% have severe and greater the degree of discordance, more is the degree of fetal growth restriction. These babies are delivered prematurely and they are at a risk of intrauterine fetal death. So how do we really follow these? We will come to these. Now look at this example. This is a case of monochorionic diamniotic twins. Twin A is 650. Twin B is 529. Can anybody tell me what is the discordant percentage? Wake up. Pens. How much is the discordant percentage? So 650 minus 529 is 121. So discordance percentage is 18.6. So is it mild or severe? Mild. And this could be so monochorionic. So what else do you need to see now? You need to see the bladder volume. You need to see the Lyca volume. Right? So impression would be a monochorionic diamniotic twins with 18% discordancy, but there is no IUGR in any of the twins. Though there is discordancy, the growth is good. 
right? The concorded bladder size, concordant like a volume. So what do we do now for this patient? We rescan her after four weeks. So is she low risk monochorionic or high risk monochorionic? Okay. This is another example. Now, how do you find the growth in this? This is fetus A, this is fetus B. How's the growth? Yeah. So it's following almost the green line and there is a linear growth. The difference is about 10%. So mild discordance, again, prognosis, good. Outcome would be good. That means they are concordant, but the discordant percentage is less than 25%. The weights are about 2.4, 2.6. Both are AGA, but there is about 10 to 15% discordancy. So the mild discordance, the prognosis is very less, uh, very good, because it just tells you the dif different genetic potential. Now another example, Gravida 3 para 1 with DCDA twins, she's GDM on insulin. How's the growth? Fetus 1 and fetus 2, how's the growth in fetus 1? AGA, LGA, AGA. What about this? Up. So what is the discordancy percentage now? This is on 50th centile, this is on 95th centile. They are discordant, 27%. So is this good, bad? Bad? One is larger, so it's not the difference, that's what I said. It is not only the difference which is important, it is how the babies have been growing. Right? This baby is actually large. They are different because one is larger. Right? So that is very important because there is 27% discordancy, but one is LGA, another is AGA. So there is a discordancy of 27%, but you look at the individual growths and you find that the growth is very good. One is average, another is... Right, another case here. IVF pregnancy, TCTA triplets reduced to DCADA twins. How do you find the growths here? It's dichorionic pregnancy now. One is below, another is on the average. So this is abdominal circumference is below the fifth centile. So, one baby is now SFGR, that means there is one baby which average, another baby is fetal growth restricted. So, discordance with fetal growth restriction has the worst perinatal outcome. There's all these examples where to say, how do you look for discordance, how do you kind of then implement your knowledge into practice. So it's not just discordance which is important, it is also how the growth has been, how is the growth velocity, what is the percentile on which the baby is grown. So SFGR and MC twins is when a, one of the babies is showing growth below the 10th percentile and usually these twins have more than 25% discordancy and this is invariably because of intraplacental anastomosis and when you use Doppler, you may either have normal Dopplers, absent end diastolic flow or intermittent absent end diastolic flow. So there's a nice article which says when there is growth restriction with discordancy, most of these babies have to be delivered prematurely and the prognosis in these fetuses is quite bad. And these fetuses need increased surveillance by Lyker amount, serial scans, Dopplers and NSTs. So one baby is very small, 1.2, another is good weight. So there is a 40% discordancy, but this twin would have been at higher risk if we had not really monitored her well. So when there is discordancy, do we need to deliver them? What does evidence says? Size discordancy alone does not appear to be an indication, but when results of antenatal testing are normal and growth restriction is absent, we should try to prolong the pregnancy to more than 32 weeks and wait of at least 2 kgs before we make any deliver. So when you plan your delivery, you, you should decide what is the curiosity, is there presence of IUGR, what is the other surveillance test showing. And if there is a 35% discordancy, that means one of the babies is definitely growth restricted and you need to do a cesarean section. Now this is our last example. Uh, CRL initially when we did the first trimester itself the CRL was one is 57 another is 58.5 NT 2.1 1.9 monochorionic twins so as the protocol says you have to do a rescan at 16th week because she's monochorionic 
So what happened at the 16th week scans were fine, 20 was fine, but 24 weeks, if you see one baby is weighing 815, another baby is weighing 410. So this discordant percentage is almost 49% and the other baby is on 0 0.1 centile. So what would we like to do now? What's your next modality of surveillance? Need to do a Doppler. We did a Doppler and of the umbilical artery. Another thing we have to do is look at the Lyca volume, look at the bladder size to exclude TTTS. So this discordancy, could it be a predictor of TTTS? Unless we look at the bladder size, look at the Lyca amount, look at all the Dopplers, you cannot exclude TTTS. So here, one fetus which is 816 had excess Lyca, but the urinary bladder was normal, average for gestational age. In the fetus too, which was smaller also, the Lyca was adequate and there was a good urinary bladder. So is this TTTS now? No. So the smaller fetus now is at a risk of IUD, so a detailed counseling was done. At 26 weeks, she was asked to come for a review and it showed a reversal of flow and there was an IUD. So it's a monochorionic fetus at 26 weeks because of extreme prematurity and the growth discordancy, there was a loss. So monochorionic pregnancies because of intrafetal and intraplacental anastomosis, especially arteriovenous, venous arterial, could lead to TTTS, TAPS, SFGR, and there is a high risk of intrauterine fetal death. So the way you have to proceed is, if it's an MCDA twin, one of the sacs has AFI more than eight, another is less than two, then you diagnose it as TTTS. If there is no Lyca discordance, then if one of the twins is less than 10 centile, you diagnose it as SFGR. If there is MCA PSV more than 1.5 and 1 and less than 0.8, then you diagnose it as TAPS, that is twins, anemia, polycythemia, sequins. But if none of these are there, it is just a case of amniotic fluid discordance and estimated fetal weight discordance. When do you time your delivery? We said yes, 38 weeks, monochorionic 37, unless there are Doppler abnormalities. Intrapartum management, when there is discordance, especially if the second twin is larger, more than 500 grams, then there's a higher risk of death, asphyxia, RDS, neonatal infections. So to conclude, whenever you see discordancy, you find out if it's monochorionic, dichorionic, what is the degree of discordancy, what is the chorionicity, how linearly is the baby growing, what are the other surveillance tests, and if there are discordant twins in monochorionic, exclude trans, uh, twin to twin transfusion, do serial biometry and Doppler studies to see that you manage your twins effectively and deliver them on time. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Geeta, for your excellent and informative lecture, as usual. And I request Dr. Umaram to hand over a moment to Dr. Geeta. We move on to the next topic on assessment of twins at 11 to 12 weeks, what to look by Dr. Mala Sibal. Good afternoon. I'll uh, now um, go through twins at NT scan that is between 11 to 13 weeks, six days. The topic of twins is massive and we will only cover certain aspects that are relevant at this time under the following headings. We first start with chorionicity and amnionicity. Uh, both Dr. Sridevi and Dr. Geeta have already emphasized the need uh, to assess chorionicity and amnionicity, that is, how much of their sacs do they share. This is perhaps the most important sonographic finding at this time. This is because amnionicity and chorionicity is what decide pregnancy outcome and not zygosity. The other reason why it is so important at this time is because very often after this, it may be very difficult or impossible to assess chorionicity. Why are we so worried about chorionicity? That is because we know as it is twins have a higher risk for complications than singleton fetuses. But even in twins, monochorionic fetuses you can see have a much higher incidence of complications than dichorionic. So what is the use of um, finding out whether it's monochorionic or dichorionic? The risk evaluation will differ in both. 
Implication of size discrepancy can be different. Genetic counseling and invasive testing, whether to test one or both, will depend on chorionicity. MCDA twins, we know, require a closer a follow-up and surveillance with Dopplers. Growth restriction, the etiology may be different in both of them. Implications of co-twin demise differs based on chorionicity and management of discordant twins also differs with mono, between monochorionic and dichorionic. That's why it is so important to know chorionicity. How do we determine it? Typically two placental masses or the twin peak sign. Membrane thickness has been used. Um, gender determination may or may not help and it's difficult at this time. Two placental masses is very easy. Um, I, or the previous speakers have already gone through this, so it's, um, we know two placentae means two chorions. But sometimes they are fused together and you have the placental tissue intervening between the two leaves of the chorion, between the two chorions uh, causing the twin peak or the lambda sign. And this complete, may completely vanish by about 16 weeks. In monochorionic twins, there's a single placenta with a thin membrane abutting onto it almost at right angles, uh, forming the so-called T sign. Membrane thickness has also been used, but it's not very useful, and if at all, it should be, the beam should be perpendicular, but it is not an efficient way of evaluation or of determining chorionicity. What about monoamniotic? In monoamniotic, there is no membrane at all, and uh, the prognosis with monoamniotic is pretty bad, and therefore it is very important to ensure and find out whether it's really monoamniotic or diamniotic, and uh, we have to look for the dividing membrane. Sometimes it's difficult. We should look at it in multiple planes, increase our gain. And it is suggested that we should repeat it a few hours apart to make sure whether it's monoamniotic or diamniotic. Now, moving on from chorionicity, we go on to size discrepancy, which Dr. Geeta has already discussed in detail. Um, dating, like she said, is always done with a CRL of a larger twin because we know of undergrowth, not overgrowth at this time. IVF fetuses, of course, uh, regardless of CRL, we take the date of embryo transfer for dating. And like Dr. Sridevi said, the technique of measuring the CRL is important, otherwise we will produce erroneous d discrepancy. Um, Dr. Geeta has already covered this CRL of one being fifth centile of the other, discrepancy of three to five days, discordance of 10%, all these are significant difference. Now what they have seen is that in MCDA, a discrepancy in size is really not a predictor of TTTS, but a pointer for selective IUGR at this time. In both MCDA and DCDA twins, they have realized that discrepancy of, um, in the CRL is not a predictor of adverse perinatal outcome, provided they have no structural or aneuploidy. However, when the, there's a discrepancy at seven to nine weeks, like Dr. Geeta, I think, already mentioned, it is a predictor for a single fetal demise in first trimester. More the discrepancy, higher the chance of fetal demise, but only in the first trimester. And in DCDA twins, if you see a difference in size, we need to make sure that there is, you know, look even more carefully because this could be a marker for an aneuploidy. Moving on from size discrepancy to chromosomal evaluation for chromosomal defects, it is just like in a singleton fetus. Screening is with age, NT, and biochemistry. Diagnosis is with uh, invasive methods. Uh, management, of course, would be selective feticide. <clears throat> now when we come to screening, there is a difference between monochorionic and dichorionic and singleton. Say there's a lady with a risk of, of a fetus of 1 in 300. In singleton, it will remain 1 in 300. In monochorionic, it will again remain 1 in 300 because it all started off from one single cell. But in dichorionic, now there are two of them, and therefore the chances of the mother having a fetus with an aneuploidy would double. So from 1 in 300, it would become 1 in 150 of at least one having, whereas the chances of both of them having will be very remote. It will be 1 in 300 into 1 in 300, which is 1 in 90,000. The risk per fetus, however, remains the same. That is one in 300. For singleton fetuses, now let's come to NT itself. For singleton fetuses, say there's a mother with, uh, you know, with her age and NT risk of one in 1,000 with an NT of two millimeter. In dichorionic twins, we calculate risk just like we would do in a singleton fetus. So if twin A has an NT of two millimeter, risk is one in 1,000. If twin B has an NT of three millimeter, risk is one in 100. But we know in monochorionic, 
uh, f um, fetuses, they come from one single cell and obviously their risk is not calculated individually but we give an average. Now how do we do this average? Say twin A has an NT of 2 millimeters with an risk of 1 in 1000 that would be, be that's equal to 0 0.1 percent in twin B with 3 millimeters it was 1 in 100 that becomes 1 percent so how do we get the average we add these two that is 1 plus 0 0.1 1.1 and we divide it by 2 so the average risk of both is 0 0.55 which would be around 1 in 182 and therefore the you know and you will see here that the risk, final average risk is closer to the risk of the twin with a higher NT. False positive rate for diagnosis based on uh, NT and age is 5% uh, in singleton and in dichorionic, but in monochorionic the false positive rate is 8% uh, because they are known to have um, higher NTs uh, very often and the reasons have been manifold including early TTTS different papers have um, cited different possible reasons for this. So for a detection rate of 75 to 80 percent per fetus, singleton is 5 percent false positive, dichorionic is 5 percent, but monochorionic is 8 percent. Whereas if you were to look at it per pregnancy, false positive rate would be 5 percent, 10 percent and 13 percent. What about serum biochemistry? How good is that? In singleton fetuses, the addition of biochemistry in screening increases the, the pickup rate by about 10 percent. From 75 to 80, it goes to 85 to 90, whereas in twins, it increases by just 5 percent. And this is because we, the, the efficacy will obviously be different because we don't know from which twin, which, you know, uh, the hormones are, you know, there may be one twin with a problem and one without, it will all get diluted. And what about the use of biochemistry in the case of vanishing twins? This is very, uh, uh, very controversial and, uh, uh, you know, it's probably less, efficacious, uh, less efficient in the case of vanishing twins. But they say if you are not able to see a CRL in the vanishing twin, then it's okay to use biochemistry or if the fetal demise was four weeks prior to biochemistry. NT discrepancy in twins is, was earlier believed and in many studies was believed to increase the risk for TTTS but in some studies it has shown it, it was shown that it's neither a pointer for TTTS nor IUGR. Along with ductus venosus however there are studies that show that if the NT discrepancy is there and the DV of the twin with a bigger NT has um, is abnormal then the risk for TTTS does increase. At NT discordance um, at NT the discordance increase if the NT discordance is very high then there is a difference in the risk but if it is a moderate amount like 15 percent that we usually say it doesn't affect much there's a study that shows that if the NT discrepancy is more than 80 percent then the risk for severe TTTS and early fetal loss increases by as much as more than 30 percent whereas if it is less than 20 percent complications are less than 10 percent what about invasive procedures at twins in this time? Um, CVS is what is typically done, but the problem is there may be more technical difficulties and sometimes with the posterior fetus, uh, the approach may be difficult for CVS and we may have to resort to amniocentesis at a little da later date. Um, bo both when we are sampling twins, we have to decide uh, uh, you know, whether we have to sample one twin or both twin, like in dichorionic. We may wish to sample both or just the affected twin, whereas in monochorionic, we can sample one or both. Generally, we sample one because though difference in uh, karyotype or difference in chromosomal, uh, um, chromosomal differences are known in monochorionic, generally they are similar. So though heterokaryotypy is known, it is uh, very, very rare. Now when we are, uh, there are a lot of technical uh, details about how you can use a single entry, you can use double entry, but most of us use double entry for sampling dichorionic twins. Now this is a clip for a, a monochorionic twin. Like I said, most monochorionic twins, we just do a um, sample, just uh, one twin.
and the rest is just like in a single. Now, what is the difference between CVS and amniocentesis? Um, the fetal loss rate is comparable, but what is really different is the timing. Uh, CVS is done earlier, and our reports come in earlier, and therefore the option of selective feticide uh, is available at a much earlier uh, date, which is safer than later uh, feticide at a later date. So CVS is the method of choice for evaluation. Now moving on to structural defects. Structural defects per fetus in singleton and dichorionic are the same, but in monochorionic, there is a three times increased risk of uh, uh, structural defects, particularly major structural defects. And this is supposed to be believed to be part of the twinning process itself because we know that we require a critical cell mass for normal. If the cell mass is not sufficient or unequal, it could result in problems. In addition, unequal sharing of the placental venous return and the um, you know, uh, constituent nutrients probably also contributes. Uh, structural uh, anomalies, I think somebody is giving a talk, so I'll quickly rush through this. Maybe some, there are some which are absolutely unique to twins, like trap, a cardiac twin, conjoint twins. There are some that are more common in twins. Uh, diaphragmatic hernia, for example, is four times more common. And there are some probably be ma mechanical or vascular related, um, like a CTV, etc. Uh, in twins, midline defects are more common, like neural tube defects, facial defects, anti abdominal wall defects. And in MCDA, cardiac anomalies are about four times more common, and therefore a fetal echo is suggested in all monochorionic twins. Um, fetuses which have structural anomalies, just like in singletons, uh, depending on the anomaly, we may require to do an invasive testing. Uh, discordance for anomalies is, is not uh, um, is, uh, common rather than concordance. And when there is concordance, obviously the option is termination. But if they are discordant for structural abnormalities or for aneuploidy, the, the options available are selective feticide versus expectant management. And when it is a lethal anomaly, what that we expected management can be resorted to because this fetus will anyway not make it, like a case of trisomy 18. But if that anomaly, even if it's lethal, is going to interfere or put the normal baby at risk, then we may opt for selective feticide. For example, anencephaly can cause polyhydramnias, and we may want to do a selective feticide. In non-lethal anomalies, of course, we have to balance the risk of having a handicapped child from uh, the risk of um, a fetal loss due to feticide. And it's obviously the parent's choice. So how selective feticide is different in DCDAs and MCDAs? In DCDAs, it's very simple. You just put in potassium chloride into the heart. There's a 1% to 3% procedure-related uh, fetal loss above the baseline. And I repeat again, this is the best time for selective feticide. CVS, a CVS done prior to selective feticide is not known to increase the risk. So if you have an anomalous baby and you want to do a CVS followed by selective feticide, they have shown that the risk is not increased for the normal fetus. In MCDA twins, of course, we resort to cord coagulation in the second trimester under ultrasound or fetal guidance. Now, this was a 28-year-old 20 primary uh, with spontaneous conception. This was a DCDA twin. You can see very well there was megacystis, um, and there was some hydronephrosis. There was a small omphalocele over here, and there was this normal fetus. So now in this case, would we want to do a selective feticide or no? Yes or no? Uh, obviously, it's the parent's choice, but but what would uh, your suggestion be? If you have hydronephrosis at 13 weeks, it's probably a PUV, the chances are that this fetus is going to have mortality is not the problem, morbidity. So this, this couple opted for a selective feticide here. You can see there uh, the heart is still beating. We did a CVS and then we did a, um, you know, We did a feticide. This, uh, this, uh, you know, after we do that, we always show the mother the heart rate of the normal baby because she feels very reassured. And this lady went on to deliver a no full-term normal de vaginal delivery, um, and a, she has a normal, healthy male baby. Now we move on to special cases. I'll quickly run through a few of them. Uh, early TTTS, um, not at NT scan. I mean, there, there are some studies that show, but. Um, the TTTS, first of all, occurs in about 15 to 25, 30, 25 to 30 percent of MC monochorionic twins, half of which are severe. 
uh, they have some studies have shown that an NT of more than 95th centile in one T has a high likelihood ratio for early TTTS. Like I said earlier, but uh, Matthias has shown that in the presence of abnormal DV, the risk increases significantly. What we do is we call these patients back at around uh, 16 weeks and we look at the intertwin membrane folding. If there is an intertwin membrane folding, the risk for TTTS is for severe TTTS is as high as 15%. Here you can see this is the recipient, that's the donor, and that is the <coughs> folding of the intertwin membrane. Increased heart rate is also supposed to be a marker for early TTTS. Now, TRAP is nothing but an extreme form of TTTS. It's very rare. And here you will see a fetus moving without heart pulsations. And um, we all know it is uh, very often diagnosed as a case of Mr. Bosch, and you suddenly see that fetus that we thought had Mr. Bosch is growing. Uh, this uh, fetus may show cystic hygroma. Now we move on to monoamniotic twins. Uh, monoamniotic twins, the fetal loss is as high as 50%. Uh, because of anomalies, cord entanglement. Typically, TTTS is not seen, but they believe sudden death may be caused by acute TTTS. Um, the early cord entanglement is better seen on TVS. At 12 weeks, you'd be able to see it looks like the umbilical cord, uh, the vessels are branching. That is a feature of cord entanglement. Then we move on to conjoined twins. Uh, again, very rare and very poor prognosis. Most patients in first trimester would uh, opt to terminate. Diagnosis is they are monoamniotic twins, but their body parts are very close and they are maintained in the same relative position. Very often the spine is extended and we might be able to see fusion at some level. Nowadays with a transvaginal scan it's much more clear and 3D can help. What about higher order multiple pregnancies? We can have triplets. Here you can see when the uh, you, there's three chorions meet, you have the epsilon sign. This is a trichorionic, triamniotic. This is a trichorionic. Dichorionic, triamniotic, and this is a monochorionic, triamniotic fetus. I mean, pregnancy. This is a case of quadruplets. You have quintuplets, and <coughs> the management in all these uh, multiple order triplets and beyond, most patients will opt for fetal reduction. <coughs> then we come to naming ceremony, which Dr. Geeta has already uh, uh, emphasized. It is very important to properly name these fetuses because um, you know we need to follow them up. We can't take measurements at, of one time of one fetus and combine it with the other fetus. It's important if we are doing invasive testing, important if we are doing selective feticide, we can't reduce the wrong fetus. <coughs> In twins, it's very simple. The fetus or the sac which is closer to the cervix is A and the other one is B. And it's not, instead of just saying um, low and higher up, like Dr. Geeta said, because the sacs may be at an angle and you may think one fetus is lower at one time and higher at another time, it is also important to tell, where, you know, in your report to mention whether it's more anterior, more to the left, more to the right, so chances of error are less. And how do we name fetuses that are really multiple higher order pregnancies? A is the one which is closest to the cervix, and thereafter we go in an anti-clockwise direction from the left lower end. Again, it's good to describe here whether it's right, left, anterior, posterior to the extent possible. So if this is a pregnancy, cervix is down, this is fetus A, B, C, D, and E is the fetus on the right. To summarize, determination of chorionicity and amnionicity is very, very important. There should be no report that says twin pregnancy. There are no twins. They're either monochorionic or dichorionic twins. Another very important thing is we have to name them and we have to stick to that uh, same, uh, you know, if it is A is by chance the one on the left, it should always be the one on the left. It's very, very important. We, it's, we have to assess the risk for aneuploidy and look for structural abnormalities, uh, particularly in twins because if it is a singleton and by chance we miss something and we see it in the fifth month, uh, it isn't okay, but it's at least we are not compromising the health of a normal twin. Whereas here, the option of selective feticide decreased. The results are poor at later pe uh, periods of gestation, so it's very, very important to do. In fact, today with good machines, we are, we are able to do a mini anomaly scan at the third month. Invasive testing with CVS can be done at this time, and uh, selective feticide and fetal reduction are also done depending on the con condition of those babies or whatever the situation or condition is. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Mala, for your informative lecture. We move on to the next topic, Cotwin Demise by Dr. Umar Ram. Okay, we've, uh, <coughs> we've heard uh, a fair amount about uh, what all we see in twins and uh, how we deal with twins with discordance. One other uh, problem which we face, not that commonly, but uh, uh, is uh, co-twin demise. And uh, it always causes um, a lot of anxiety and uh, it, needs, it, it needs a lot of